Hey, and welcome to the show today. You're listening to Sensensa.com, Feel Your Heart podcast. And we have another really great show for you today. This podcast is made by Sensensa.com, the leading relationship institute for relationship skills and courses based on science made practical. To get the one hour free webinar that will give you the key skills to get a safe, intimate and passionate relationship, just go to Sensensa.com and sign up. The link is in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and leave a review. It really helps me keep the positive energy going to make more podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. Today we've got Melanie on the show and I'm really excited to talk to Melanie about self-compassion and also stress and how that impact relationships and also especially obviously in the COVID circumstances that we have at the moment. So welcome to the podcast, Melanie. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Oh, me too. And I think just to get started, would you be able to give the listeners just a little background about your work and, and what it is that you're doing so they also know who you are? Sure. So I have a couple of different hats. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist and yet working near San Francisco and have a busy practice. And then I've also written a book called The Stress-Proof Brain where I talk about how the brain processes stress and how that impacts us in different situations and how things like mindfulness and self-compassion can really help you with your stress. And then I also see individuals and couples and write on these topics um, about couples and these other topics for psychology today. Perfect. And actually, I'm going to go buy your book. I looked up yesterday and it has really good reviews on Amazon. So I would recommend people to look it up if they want to learn more about their stress response and, and how they can cope with that. And actually, that's where I really want to start the conversation today is talk a bit more about stress and also how stress impacts, you know, interpersonal relationships. Is that something you can talk a bit about? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's very relevant to today's world, today's world is, is very stressful in many ways with COVID and stay at home and you know, government and big, big changes in society. I think it's, things are different. You know, the working world is different. In, in, in the US anyway, there's lots of layoffs and things like that. So it's very relevant. And we have an automatic response in our brain to stress. There's a part of our brain called the amygdala, which is an emotion area. And the function of the amygdala is to alert us for something to pay attention to, but in particular, something that's a threat in our environment that we need to respond to. And when the amygdala gets triggered, we it can hijack our brains from our rational thinking brain, kind of it goes a little bit offline. And the amygdala takes us into a more primitive response like, called fight or flight. And so, you know, your heart may race or you may have shallow breathing or feel sweaty, or you may have very rapid thinking or feel hot. And your brain is actually making your body react to the stress as if it was an immediate threat, like you were facing a lion or a tiger, because that's what our ancestors used to face. And it doesn't always fit with the stresses in today's world, but that's what happens. And it can knock us off balance. It can make us say things we don't mean to say. Uh, it can make you run away from something. It can make you get really mad at your, your partner and things like that or feel panicky. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for giving that introduction. And I also think it's important to also remember, uh, I think, in relation to this, how the brain works, that often the stress response we might feel in a moment or something our partner is doing isn't just something that's triggered purely by what they're doing very often it also has something to do with our past experiences right and they can greatly enhance that stress response that we might have to something that's occurring in the moment because we had something similar happening maybe in the past that was very stressful and where our brain learned that this could be a danger just to give an example of what i mean is it could be you know a husband that's closing the door very loudly when he leaves the house and his wife get up and get really angry and shout at him and say why do you do that how dare you shut the door that's so disrespectful and you know it could be again that would then cause an argument he will start defending himself but instead is he if he knew her past maybe she had an alcoholic dad that would 
banging the door very loudly when he left and he was really drunk and aggressive, then it makes a lot more sense that there would be such an excessive response, right? And even understanding that can help us have more compassion for each other, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's key. When we have traumas in our past or attachment traumas, like somebody neglected you or a very critical parent, it can continue in an unconscious way, what we might call implicit memories. So some of those memories are stored in our brain in a very raw form. It's not stored as, as kind of a, a, a neat story, you know, with a summary that's all integrated. Rather, we have these kind of strong reactions, whether it's in your body or you have a certain view of yourself or the other, like see, start seeing the other person as a threat, for example, or start seeing yourself as unsafe or as unlovable. Uh, all of this is triggered by implicit memories from the past, and it does feed our reactions. So if the partner can under, see how it really, it's understandable given what, what you experienced, that, that is key, I think. Yeah, and what can couples really do then to, to try and manage that stress? So let's say something has kicked off and they're, and they're about to get into a fight. Well, what are ways, I guess, both pre-empty not to get into that place and also when they are in that place, what are kind of some strategies that they can use to avoid it going down in, in two two stress responses fighting it off against each other. Right, which is just what often happens. So, you know, these responses are very rapid. The amygdala works very rapidly. In fact, the information goes to the amygdala before it even goes to your thinking brain or to your cortex. So it's it's it takes a lot of practice. You have to just keep practicing catching it. Um, when you notice, like, what are the first signs of this happening? Often it's something happening in your body, like you you know, you know, feel like a rush of emotion or you may have a, a pattern of thinking, oh, he's such a jerk you know, or something like that. So you can start to think of those particular thoughts or that reaction in your body uh, as a sign that, that you've been knocked off balance, you know, that you're not in your kind of healthy adult brain anymore, but rather in your threat brain. And when that happens, the most important thing is, is to call a stop. And so it would be, one really good tool is for the partners to each have a, a signal that they can use to call, either one can call a stop, like stop, we're not in our adult brains anymore kind of thing. And then uh, like to then to take a, a quick a break, maybe five minutes or 10 minutes and just everybody sits and breathes. Or if somebody needs to go in the other room to calm down, that would be okay. So, you know, but just tell the person when you're coming back. And then you can practice your mindfulness. So the main thing would be to slow your breathing, to just to watch your breathing and just gently kind of slow it down. Because when your breathing slows, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system can put the brakes on that fight or flight response. Uh, uh, in other words, and the breathing communicates with your heart, for example, and with your organs. And it gets your heart rate to slow down. So then when you come into the back into the conversation, you're coming from a more grounded place, which is, a, you know, that can always work better. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And also, I think what I often say, and we'll talk more about mindfulness in a minute. Also, I like to add the, the idea of using movement, because again, like you said, the stress response is very much about fight, flight or freeze meaning we are supposed to actually be moving, right? That's that's what I want. That's why we get adrenaline pumped into the body. So often mm -hmm. I found it hugely beneficial to do some kind of movement, whether it's do a dance around your living room, um, mm -hmm. go in the bedroom and box your pillow, <laughs> go for a little run, <laughs> what, whatever it is people you know prefer. That can be individual, but just somehow move the body, I find works really well. And then combination with what you said, the deep breathing, that then activate the parasympathetic nervous system and help us calm down. Because as we know, if both people are triggered, like you said, we are not in our adult brain anymore. We are reptiles and nothing constructive will come <laughs> from that place. So until we learn we can calm that down, we can't really have a constructive way of moving forward, right? Exactly. Um, so I like what you said about movement as another part. So an example of what I might use for anger is to just have the person could push against the wall, like just push with all your might against the wall. And that's also can, that kind of gets the energy out in a similar way to what you're saying and can make you feel more like grounded, like in touch with the present, I guess would be. 
Um, but I, it's, it's a combination, you know, some people just need like, like more calming down, but also release is really good because of the nature of the instinct as you talked about. Um, I like that what you said about pushing against the wall. I think an exercise that my somatic therapist gave me was to use a pillow sometimes to also to help you know self-regulate and basically squeeze the pillow together and squeeze it as tight as you can and hold it for however long 10-15 seconds and then slowly let go and similar that also kind of release that excessive mm-hmm. stress and, and help calm down again well, that's really good too um it's kind of like I, the goal is to get not to continue the conversation when you're in the wrong frame of mind because it's not going to go anywhere good and so, you know, something to ask yourself also, before, like when you start to get triggered is, am I in the right frame of mind to have this conversation? You know, am I in my healthy adults would be a good analogy. Um, and you eventually with practice, yeah, you begin to recognize when you're, when you're not. And then these techniques can be very helpful in, in getting back to your healthy adult so you can continue. Mm, I like that. And I also think this kind of, leads into the next question about mindfulness because I feel that these are what we're talking about now is strategies to manage when we are in the mess and it's happening but I also think there's a lot of pre-work that we can do when we are not in stress response to help our mind become more calm right because some people don't even have that self-regulation so they can't even stop if even if they have a signal they give each other because they simply don't have that self-regulation of their emotional response and what are ways that Mm. people can maybe do to develop that you know that self-control so they're able to engage and what can they do outside the conflict zone to practice this yeah that's a really good point as well that um the brain changes um with small practices repeated often so you know we we we, you're right. Some people's brains have gotten conditioned that it's just so fast, and you know that they just they don't have that control in the moment. But you can learn to have more, and you can change actually change the fear centers of your brain by practicing meditation and mindfulness. Um, and mindfulness, what what the definition of mindfulness is that you're able to kind of be open. In, a, in an open way to pay attention to whatever's happening in the present moment, whether it's in your in your be in your body or in your environment, things that you're seeing, hearing, feeling, smelling, um, or even you know listening to what your partner's saying, noticing the expression on their face, things like that. And so, when you're on your own, like mindfulness is kind of a, it can be a daily practice or several times a week is what makes it most effective. You can start with 10 minutes, but it would be the ideal is about 20 to 30 minutes. But it's more important the regularity, you know, that you, you do it every day to begin with, even if it's not for as long a time. And there's different mindfulness practices. One of is just watching the breath, the most basic. So you sit quietly. Um, and you just begin to notice your breath going all the way in and all the way out. So you're following your breath in your mind's eye and noticing, you know, where it goes down your nose, down your throat, into your stomach. And then there's a pause between the in and out breath and then you follow it out again. And you can even think to yourself, I am breathing in, when I come out, I am breathing out. And what will happen is that your mind will wander. And that's not a problem. That's just what minds do. It's in a way part of the practice. Your mind wanders and you catch it. And then you you gently touch where it's going, like a judging thought. You might say, oh, there's my uh, judging thought. Let me, and then you direct it, you direct it back to your breath. And then it wanders off, you know, 10 times, you direct it back 10 times, just with a calm energy. Um, and eventually you, you're learning to track more where your mind's going and you're training your mind to come back to the anchor um, when it wanders off. And that has all kinds of effects in the stress centers of the brain, as well as helping with more, you feel more compassion or help your brain be more kind of integrated. 
Yeah, so I think a lot of also what you talk about here in the mindfulness training is becoming aware of our state of mind, right? Which I guess is a very first step to be able to step in. And if we have that awareness and we practice that, then that also means we know where we're at. And, and just to give an example how that could be helpful, let's say you are walking home from work and you had a really stressful day and you know you're stressed rather than to walk straight into the house with that with your spouse that might set you up for not a good start being aware of that maybe use some of the tools for self-regulation we just talked about whether it's um, going for a short little run around around the block a few times <laughs> while practicing your breathing or whatever it is to just kind of regulate yourself before you go into the house and and again I guess that start with what you just described now having that mindfulness and awareness of where we are um, and I also just wanted to say because well, we talked a bit about tools for self-regulation whether it's running breathing but also of course the beauty of a, a couple dynamic is that we can help co-regulate each other's nervous system right mm -hmm. whether that's mm -hmm. through touch or I always try to say to people make sure that when you're talking about issues to always sit face to face and have eye contact because what I've seen often is that people do it in a car or while they're watching tv and yeah. because they, they are not looking at each other, first of all, it's less connecting, right? But also because mm -hmm. we only have them in our peripheral vision, that's more likely to trigger our adrenaline gland even more, right? And make us more stressed. So I always say even these basic things, we feel more safe when we're facing somebody. I can see them and we have a visual perspective of everything going on. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to mention that too, that co-regulation of how we can kind of help regulate each other but one of the things i wanted to discuss with you more is obviously we are all stuck in this covid lockdown in different ways around the world and i guess it's relevant to talk a bit about how the stress of that how you know in the covid itself how that's affecting both people individually but also their relationships for those that are in relationship yeah that's so the covid i think is having a very big impact uh, they found there was one study in China that found that when people came out of lockdown, there was a much higher rate of divorce. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a stress in our relationships in many ways and also individually. So basically there's a threat to life in our environment. So, you know, there's, there's like this lurking threat out there that's invisible and uncertain. We don't know when it's going to end, if it will end. And those are all the things our brain doesn't like. Our brains get very unhappy when there's a threat to life, when it's invisible, when we can't control it. We can't, you know, you don't know when it's coming. It's unpredictable. And um, also, you know, when it, there's no kind of clear ending, you get a, a sense of helplessness and that other people in, are making decisions about it, you know, that affect your lives very much, but that, you know, you can't really be part of those decisions. They're happening on the government level. Um, so it, it really creates insecurity and fear. And I think also there's something about seeing other people as threats, you know, other people really can transmit the virus to us. So when you go outside, you, you know, you wear your mask, are you looking around at somebody too close to me? So it's kind of like, you know, you're feeling a different sense with other people that, that like feel more threatened. And, um, in terms of a relationship, it, the lockdown makes you kind of stuck together 24 hours a day. And for some people, if the kids aren't at school, you know, you're also trying to manage a job and online and childcare. And, and, you know, you don't get those breaks to replenish or you don't get those positive experiences together as much um, that are bonding for you. So it can be a big stress. It's important to, to balance, you know, like, time al alone with time together, even if you're spending time in separate rooms, sometimes it's important to tune into your needs. Like, what do I need here? Is that too much to do togetherness or do I need more connection? And, you know, to try to, to make that happen in, in, in new ways. It requires a real kind of adjustment and resilience, I think. Yeah, and I think it's important also to just, what I like about talking about this is just having the awareness mean that, you know, I think often people because of their circumstances, think that their relationship isn't working and it's over. And I think just understanding that it's natural 
to have some challenges and finding the relationship a bit extra difficult when we are stuck together, like you said, 24-7 without space and that we can't get the time for ourselves as well that maybe we need. And that means that maybe instead of jumping to quick conclusions and saying, oh, I don't like my partner anymore, we're not good together, then just also remember the context of what's happening and that context obviously have a big implication of how we feel towards each other. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention that as well. That's a really good point. Yeah, like don't assume it's all your partner, that the environment is, is having a very big impact. And a number of levels, I mean, you know, you if nobody's doing much, like you don't have much to talk about <laughs> as much as you used to. So you're not bringing, you know, more like fun and stimulation back into the relationship as much. Um, but it, they're having a more compassionate mindset and, and more of like a collective view, I think, can be helpful. Like we're in this together, you know, we may be coping in different ways, but basically we're going through this together, you know, so that can be a source of, of shared experience of bonding. And, um, you know, just, you know, that my the, my partner's, you know, is, is struggling in some ways the way that I'm struggling. Yeah. There's a common humanity that we share. I think I think that mindset can be helpful as well. Yeah, I think so. And also, I guess if people are able to maybe set some goals together and then work on those together, then that can give them something to look forward to um, at the same time as accepting that this is just the current state we're in right now and it's natural. And also this idea that we are not always going to feel good with each other in relationship. That's also part of it. Mm -hmm. I think we often have this expectation that we should always feel the butterflies, you know, and that, and that is just not yeah. always a realistic expectation. So I feel even sometimes right. adjusting expectations can be really beneficial, right? I love that. Expectations make such a big difference. And, you know, we all have, we were pre presented with this Hollywood view of relationships and of sexuality. And it's also, you know, exciting and, and thrilling. And, and yeah, the real life isn't really like that most of the time. You know, you're doing the dishes and <laughs> figuring out who takes the kids to school or, or right. who's going to homeschool the kids or whatever. Yeah, and I guess also partly what they found, I think, in positive psychology was very much that, that, you know, depending on our point of comparison, actually decided very much how happy we felt with our lives. So this is, again, where it is important to not buy into that Hollywood dream and also realize what is what is the circumstances we are now. And yes, we are in COVID, we are in lockdown, all the fun things, a date, it's not really happening. And so this is what we have, and that's okay. It doesn't mean that we're not a good couple. Um, but what I wanted to ask you about too is if you could talk, because you talked a bit about the brain earlier, about the amygdala, could you maybe talk a bit about what actually happens in the brain when couples are not really getting along or when they have, you know, yeah, also more long-term if it's not just a single conflict. What is actually going on? Yeah, so... I'll talk about in the moment and then long term. So in the moment, I think when the amygdala gets triggered, what happens is we are we unconsciously start to see the other person as a threat. And, you know, so the other person become, feels unsafe to us at some level in a very basic physiological level. And, you know, we're getting feedback from the person's tone of voice or from the way they're looking at us or from the things they're saying. And um, so we move, you know, from sort of being open to connection, when, um, a mode, you know, in which we kind of, we, we, can, we can connect to actually a mode in which we can't connect, where we just become self-protective and um, see the other person at some level as a threat. And so we have to protect ourselves by fighting with them or getting away from them. And when you're in that frame of mind, you know, like you can't regulate each other. In fact, it can be the opposite that you, you're triggering each other. Um, and then long, so that's why it's so important to kind of, you know, learn those regulation skills and learn, you know, to kind of calm down your brain as well with, you know, with not so much judgment and like with more acceptance, you know, they are human too, you know, they have their foibles too. Um, they suffer like I suffer. And long term, I think you can get into cycles with couples where it's just the same like you, you rub each other's raw spots is what I would say. Like you have these themes, you know, even if like you don't, you don't do enough in the housework or, you know, you, you, you're rejecting me or whatever it is, um, you know, you're not earning enough. 
you can get into these like hitting people's very sensitive spots. And when that happens over and over again, it becomes sensitized. Your brain becomes more reactive to, you know, the first sign of, of that theme coming up and you overreact. Um, so, you know, that's important for couples to understand, like, what are your raw spots, your hot spots? And, um, you know, maybe it's been, can you talk about just the current situation rather than bringing in that theme, you know, to try to be aware not to bring in that theme that's so so triggering or so hurtful to the other person. Mm, yeah, I like that. And also, I guess the saying in neuroscience, what fires, wires, meaning, like you said, the more we keep going over the same pattern, the more likely that is to reappear and come up again and again. So I guess that's also yeah, why it's important to find ways to kind of break that cycle and even recognize if we are stuck in a cycle, right? And see, hey, can you see how we keep going through the same pattern again and again and again? Um, and I think, yeah, people often try to, when they have arguments, to have logical debates, right? And, and say, right. you did this, no, you did this, and they forget the fact that they're having often an emotional conversation. So logic might not be the tool to try and resolve <laughs> it, and often isn't even a tool. Instead, they need to recognize that, okay, my partner's feeling unsafe, and it's that yeah. fundamental safety need I need to address. Not that, you know, she's upset that it's not about me being 10 minutes late. There's something else going on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. The other logic, like you want to explain yourself. But and the person's not even in the right part of their brain to really take that in. You're yeah, right. Exactly. And I also wanted to hear is there some other strategies maybe that you could recommend for people to try and make their relationship more resilient? Obviously, if you mentioned the mindfulness, are there other ways that, that couples can try and work with that? Yeah. Um so you know, I think asking for what you need and sort of trying to try to see things in terms of unmet needs versus judgments. So, you know, you might say, oh, he's, you know, he's so selfish or, she, you know, or she's, she's so unreasonable. Like often we make these judgments about each other. And if you, if you're making a judgment, if you can just take a step back and, and think, well, let me, let me look back to myself, you know, what's happening with me and what, what am I really needing? You know, what need of mine is not being met now? So, you know, maybe if you're thinking the person's being unreasonable, maybe you need, you want the person to be more open, you know, to hearing you or, um, you know, you want the person to be more tolerant. So part of, part of it is like learning to just tune into yourself. What am I feeling and what do I need? And if you can, if you can communicate that to the other person, um, using I statements, you know, the you is very triggering. You is like an accusation. So instead of saying you, if you could say, well, when I notice this, you're doing this, you know, I feel blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, when I notice you putting all the wet towels on the ground, I I feel annoyed because, you know, like neatness is important to me. It's a very, that's an ex a very basic example. But it's a way of saying it that's a lot more, you know, compassionate and a lot more tuned in with what's really going on here versus getting caught in the same old script. And also you're dealing more with like just this situation, you know, what's happening just in, what do I need just in this situation versus getting into a part of your brain where it's, where it's just repeating, seeing everything in terms of old patterns. Yeah, and I like that. And also, I guess it's also, again come back to that self-awareness being able to express why we have those needs and why it makes us feel a certain way that, that it makes it easier i like the, the the saying where i remember when i read about storytelling in hollywood films and they always say we feel empathy with the character when we understand their why and i think actually that was a very important yeah. lesson also for psychology because if we just see the reaction then we just react to the reaction. So if that's anger, we often get defensive or angry back, right? But if we understand the why, yeah. then suddenly it helps our part of our brain that's empathetic to engage. So it could be, you know, if my partner is late and, and I'm just shouting, saying, how dare you be late? That's so disrespectful. They're probably just going to become defensive. But if I instead do what you said and say, you know, I feel really upset um, that you're late because it makes me feel that I'm not really worthy and, and that I'm not important to you um, because mm -hmm. I feel if I was important, you would be on time. 
So it's really important mm-hmm. for me that you are on time. And if you can't, that you at least call me and let me know. Otherwise, I stand here and I feel like a fool. And again, that's a much more vulnerable way, right? And again, because I could give them my why, it elicits, I'm sure the listener can even hear, it's much elicits more empathy, right, than the first example. Just that I can say, you know, it makes me feel I'm not important. Because um, that kind of makes them understand, oh, okay, that makes sense. That's why it's not nice for him when I'm late. And that makes it more likely also that they would comply in the future with my request, right, which is that they call me or they make sure they're on time. Yeah, I, I really like that example. Thank you. A lot of times people are feeling I'm not important or I'm not respected or not valued. Yeah, because um, I guess we were made to feel like that a lot when we were children, right, in many instances. Exactly. Yeah, you know, that. so it brings back that old experience. And so, you know, that whole experience of sort of a child whose needs were not seen or or, were vi- or boundaries were violated, you bring it into the experience. But often, you know, we have vulnerable feelings underneath the anger. And, you know, that's sort of the fight. The anger can sometimes be a secondary emotion. It's covering up what's really underneath. And what's really underneath is often hurt or rejection, you know, or feeling or feeling insecure. And so the more, you know, even practicing with yourself, like, can I look underneath my anger, you know, or even when you calm down a little bit from your anger, or, you know, what's underneath and I can look for the softer feelings. That's a really good point. I'm so happy you actually brought that up because I find that maybe more with men than women, because we obviously are often raised um, very differently yeah. because of gender. But I feel for a lot of men, anger has been an emotion that's very acceptable. While, like you said, the softer mm-hmm. emotion, not so often men only get as far as feeling angry. And I mm-hmm. think you're mm-hmm. very right in what you say. And I found often when I looked behind my anger and calmed down, I could actually sense behind that I was really sad. And it was really that I felt, like you said, either rejected or sadness. And actually, that's what I needed to work on and look at instead of the, but the anger was my default because that's kind of what I learned was was an acceptable male emotion to have, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm so happy you brought that up because I think for a lot of men, it often stops with the anger and that's all they experience mm-hmm. and see and feel. Um, and often mm-hmm. they miss the opportunity, I guess, to really figure out what is actually happening. Yeah, exactly. Men in particular, you know, so your social socialization kind of takes away uh, your connection with a lot of softer feelings, and they, those feelings, you know, if you feel weak. You've been taught that's weak, or you know, that's going to get you hurt, or so, or harmed, or bullied, or so. It's it's, it's kind of undoing some of that learning. Um, like for teenage boys, you, they allowed two states, you know, angry, or, angry or cool. <laughs> like they not they're not really, al- you know, allowed other feelings. And um, so it's a journey, I think, you know, for men to even like begin to start to open yourself up. But if you do, you, you can have a whole, you know, new relationship with yourself, where you're more likely to get your needs met, and with your partner as well. Yeah, it kind of takes me into another question I wanted to ask you is also, because we're talking a bit about this already, why is it so hard for many people to express their needs in relationships? And I guess we started a bit talking about it. For men, they simply are not in touch with those more vulnerable emotions and not comfortable mm-hmm. expressing them. But I also think for a lot of women, it's very difficult, right? Maybe they feel mm-hmm. their needs are not important. Would you be able to talk a bit about that? What What might be the blocks for people to actually express their needs? Yeah, that's a really good point. So for men, yeah, it's that socialization and that anger is the only acceptable emotion. Um, for women uh, in general, a lot of women, I think, are taught to focus on other people rather than focusing on themselves. You know, so it's kind of like, how's, how, um, how's this other person feeling? Whether it's like, sometimes that can become controlling, you know, like, Oh, I like I want you to change in this way, and you know you see kind of all the faults in your partner, and um, and you try and can sometimes be coming from a good place of trying to help them, but the way you express it, it can come across as nagging or controlling, um, and so it doesn't really work. So, and also you know for women sometimes they, the other pattern I think is that you do too much, you know like you step in and take care of things and then nurture people and. 
and then then you're not really in touch with yourself and how that's that's affecting you or how you really feel about it and you're not setting enough boundaries and so then you start feeling resentful and then you know you get a resentful script in your head and then that suddenly you know you kind of be burst out with a, with a lot of hostility that your partner sometimes doesn't know where that's coming from so for for women i think to, yeah to connect what do i need you know when do i need to take a break what are my boundaries um, where, what's the balance of my needs with the other person's needs or with the family's needs? So are very important things to look at. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. And I think that's so true, this idea that I think, again, often falls into how women are socialized is that they have to be caretakers, right? And they have to mm-hmm. take care of other people's needs. And often they even learn, you can see it very early on, even in children, how they learn that, they have to prioritize the other person over what their own needs mm-hmm. are, you know, and that often means they just get pushed aside, I guess, and that becomes a habit. So, yeah, I think that's a really good point to just notice that and realize that actually it doesn't serve you and not the relationship because over time you we're just going to build up resentment if you don't express your needs and that will harm both you and your relationship. So I'm really happy you brought that up. I think my last question to you today would be if there's anything – that you could mention that you think maybe is what would you see is the most important thing to focus on in a relationship to stay in connection is there like is there one or a couple of things that you think are like the main key things that people should focus on yeah so safety i think safety is is one of the biggest ones because if you're not feeling safe then the part of your brain that's called the social engagement network the part of your brain that connects it it switches off so you know how can I make myself safer to my my partner or how can I learn to feel safer in this situation like if it's being affected so much by your past how can I come back to the present and realize the past is over you know and the situation is more safe and then I think intimacy um, and that you know physical or emotional and emotional I think both are important um, so intimacy can be physical touch, but it can also be, you know, listening. Um, it can be like, you know, exp- like speaking from a deeper part of yourself, or it, it even can be doing things together, you know, that you, that you become closer. Um, but really intimacy sometimes is something that doesn't happen automatically. So you have to tune in and, and work on it. Um, because the negative can dominate, you know, the negative grabs our brains more. So it's really important to, to consciously build the positive and to consciously build connection and intimacy. Um, so it's, and um, then the other thing I think is just the ability to compromise and resolve conflict and, you know, to get off your own position. Sometimes people just get stuck in a certain point of view and if they don't budge off it, you, you can't get anywhere. So really being kind of trying to really open yourself up to the other person's, what's it like to be in their shoes? Um, so then I think it's important too. I like that. And also, I guess, look for what I call win-win because yes, we might be able to persuade our partner into something, but if they don't really want that, again, it will come at a price, right? It will come at eventually mm-hmm. resentment that will cost the relationship later down the line. So I think it's important to always realize that our needs are valid and important but not to impose them and to start to say here how can we both win from this and that attitude also create more collaboration right instead of us being against each other and you trying to get your needs and me trying to get my needs instead we look at how can we both win from this i love that that's so, yeah that that's a really like a really simple way to to think about it that make you know can get you into that frame of mind yeah, but Melanie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing, you know, your ideas and your thoughts and the theory. What I wanted to, if people want to find you and get more information about what you're doing, I want to work with you. How can they find you? Sure, you know, and I, I actually work um, with people all over the world in um, through Zoom. I mean, Zoom is a great tool these days, um, and so you can find me on my website. Um, drmelaniegreenberg.com. Uh, if you if you don't remember that, you can actually just Google Melanie Greenberg PhD, and you know at my website or some other should come up. I also have a blog for Psychology Today, 
and it's called the Mindful Self Dash Express, the Mindful Self Express with a dash in the middle. And um, in my website, there's a contact form. And then you can look on Amazon or Barnes and Noble um, for my book, The Stress Proof Brain, or you can go to my website and find a link. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Melanie. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you so much, Thomas. I hope you enjoyed the show today. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and come back for our new weekly podcast. Also, leave a review to keep the positive energy going. That really keeps me motivated to make more of these podcasts. If you want to learn the key skills to a safe, intimate, and passionate relationship, then head over to sensensor.com and join the free one-hour webinar. The link is in the description. You'll learn the four reasons that relationships break down, the how your attachment style may fuel conflict with your partner and how to break that cycle, why people cheat and the one tip that can prevent it, the simple three-step formula to lasting love. So thank you for joining us today and I look forward to seeing you next week for another podcast. <laughs>